When you think of F1 documentaries, you're immediately drawn to the stories of F1 icons, Senna, Schumacher, Mansell, Villeneuve Peroni, and of course, most recently, Braun GP. What you don't think of is one of F1's worst ever teams. Yet while the glitzy Keanu Reeves-led big-budget Braun story was making waves on Disney+, Plus, in the shadows the tale of another short-lived and in its own ways unforgettable team was given an independent release with far less fanfare. You might struggle to believe this, but yes, there really is a proper, in-depth documentary about Andrea Moda, the team constantly panned for being hopeless that was eventually kicked out of F1 before the end of its only season. There's no Hollywood star fronting it, no major backing behind it, and currently no global streaming powerhouse making it available to the world, unless you think a private on-demand release on Vimeo fits that billing. For those who don't know, the Little Italian Team story will give you the short version, and if you want the long version, head back to Series 4, Episode 8 of our Bring Back V10's Classic F1 podcast for a deep dive. Andrea Moda was a shambolic F1 team that was in way over its head, operating on a shoestring budget as so many teams did during the memorable pre-qualifying era of F1. Yet for all its failings, including a complete inability to ever field two cars that could run properly and similar difficulties when it came to paying bills, somehow this ragtag team managed to qualify for a race in Monaco of all places. That was the only highlight of a season that was cut short when mysterious team boss Andreas Assetti was arrested in the Belgian GP paddock later in the season. Despite attempts to be let into the paddock next time out at Monza and even filing an entry for 1993, the team was never seen again, in F1 that is. In the three decades since, the Andre Moda story has become legendary. Its failure effectively represented the end of hopeless chances taking a shot at F1, and the shambolic stories of what went on that year have become iconic. So we want to share with you the story of this three-part film and how it came together. Not because we're being paid to, I have to make clear this is not an advert, but this is a fantastic independent project that deserves to have more people know about it, and as we release this, the price to watch it on Vimeo has been reduced for the holiday season. Again, still not an advert, we just want to help them out because we like what they've done. This isn't just some glorified, lifted from Wikipedia retelling of the story. The crew behind this, who aren't motorsport fans, overheard the story of Andrea Moda in a bar in late 2019 and became fascinated by it. There were obstacles to overcome, including the COVID pandemic. F1 initially refused to cooperate on the film, denying access to its archives. That cost the production company a deal it had agreed for a release in Italy. Later on in production, a decision was made to follow advice to change the title, as there was a risk that the original, Last and Furious, could get them in trouble with Universal, the owner of the Fast and Furious franchise. So the title was changed to Andrea Moda Formula, the craziest team ever. There was also a reprieve from F1. The filmmakers tracked down F1 CEO Stefano Domenicali, who found the idea of the documentary so amusing that he not only agreed to open up F1's archives, for a hefty price of course, but volunteered to be interviewed too. While the former Ferrari F1 boss has nothing to do with the Andrea Moda story, Domenicali's presence, filmed in his London F1 office, adds credibility to the film, which is split into three roughly 45-minute episodes. Nigel Mansell appears too. His relevance to Andrea Moda doesn't stretch any further than the fact that he won the World Championship during the team's only season, and despite declaring he remembers them well, he has a fair bit of trouble pronouncing the name correctly. Andrea Moda. Andrea Moda. Andrea Moda. But that doesn't matter. Names like Domenicali and Mansell add gravitas, while it's the people who were part of the team that are the beating heart of the story. It's a nice reminder that not everyone who was associated with Andrea Moda was automatically clueless about F1. Drivers Roberto Moreno and Perry McCarthy appear at length, as does Alex Caffey, one of the drivers the team initially signed before he agreed to walk away, and Antonio Tamburini, who drove an Andrea Moda liveried Coloni at the Bologna Motor Show's indoor trophy at the end of 1991. Caffey comes off as charming and not at all bitter about the nightmare situation he managed to extract himself from, while McCarthy delivers his classic one-liners in a style you can tell has been perfected over many years. But it's Moreno who is the hero of the story, in more ways than one. He's the man who performed the miracle of Monaco, somehow dragging an Andrea Moda onto the grid for a Grand Prix. 
and he stars in the film as well. You can tell how much it meant to him to lead the team, even if he admits he was doing it for the money, and how proud he was to achieve something nobody else can say they did. Monaco is naturally one of the key parts of the story and it's told well in the film. We won't go into too much detail here because there is a revelation about how such a wayward team suddenly had a car capable of qualifying for a race and we don't want to spoil it. The story of that weekend is also supplemented brilliantly by self-shot footage from a friend of Sassetti's who attended the event, giving it a raw, behind-the-scenes feel that takes you beyond what the F1 cameras captured. And that's where a big part of the charm of this story lies. Without so many people around the team filming things at the time, it wouldn't work. Yes, the story would be the same, but the visuals are a huge part of any documentary. And if you're going back 30 years, you want to feel like you're being taken back to that time and you want to see things you've not seen before. This film delivers on that all the way from Sassetti hooning around the streets in a red and white colony that he bought for personal use before he got into F1 to extensive footage of what he did with his remaining cars after F1's doors were slammed in his face. The what happened next part of the Andrea Moda story has never been told before and here we get to not only understand what Sassetti and co got up to, but we get to see a lot of it too. Again, no spoilers here, although it's fascinating to see how many dusty car parts and bits of equipment from 1992 are still being kept in an Italian lockup somewhere. And while Sassetti retained the colonies that he tried to enter at the start of 1992, what happened to the Simtek designed cars the team ended up running has been shrouded in mystery. In the crew's mission to find out where those cars went, the story takes some unexpected turns, all very befitting of the bizarre narrative that has been built around this team's short existence. The key to any good piece of storytelling is to get access to all the right people, and in the case of Andrea Moda, that means you need the boss, Andrea Sassetti himself. Given he has barely spoken about his F1 story in the years since, just seeing him and hearing from him feels significant, but he's not just a talking head. We get to hear a lot more about his background. There's a story of how he built up his fashion label, his general interest in F1, and what made him decide to take the plunge into team ownership in the first place. Lots of people have talked about Andrea Moda and often mocked it over the years, but Sassetti has told little of his side of the story. And you get a sense of the real person behind the F1 caricature. He's one of many people who get emotional recalling Monaco, and you get the impression that it means more to him now than it did at the time. For all that there's a constant narrative throughout the three episodes that Andrea Moda was unwanted by F1 and treated poorly, there's an acceptance from Sassetti that he made mistakes too, which he puts down to being young and swaggering. If that paints quite a sympathetic picture of a man who raised plenty of suspicion during his brief dalliance of F1, well of course it does. That's almost always the way with documentary storytelling where there's a lead protagonist. You're bound to hear one side of the story most predominantly. The same could be said for Netflix's epic The Last Dance and Michael Jordan. While Sassetti admits to some mistakes, there are parts of the Andrea Moda story that go unanswered. There's the odd mention of why a certain bill didn't get paid to a key supplier, but it's not explored in any depth just how few bills were really being paid and why that was the case. And while McCarthy's comedy travails in the second car are given plenty of airtime, there's no real explanation given for why this team was so incapable of rolling two functioning cars out of the garage every weekend. The obvious answer is money, but again the finances aren't addressed in great detail. The main focus is on how these against the odds warriors were the victims of poor treatment by F1. Make of that what you will, but don't let that cloud your judgement of the documentary itself. If you're aware of the Andrea Moda story and want to hear first-hand accounts of just how crazy it was and see what it was like behind the scenes, you have to check this out. If this is the first you're hearing of it, you won't want to miss a real insight into a bygone era of F1 and just how shambolic things could be for those trying and usually failing to make the grid. As I said earlier, we've not been paid to promote this film. We even paid our own money to watch it on Vimeo rather than receiving free access for a review. We're sharing this story with you because it's a small, independent project that has done an incredible job digging up a famous but unfashionable story and it deserves to be seen by more people.